Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. Well, glad that you are here with us today. Uh, my name is JD, and I'm just part of the team, and I'm excited to eventually explain what this is about, but also just share uh, where our heart is for this season and what's happening, and I'm excited for that. So first thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to read God's Word. Can we stand up for a minute? We're going to take a moment. This is kind of a good way to honor, but I want to read the story that we're going to focus on today, this historical account of Jesus in the Bible and uh, we're just going to read that together. And so in Luke 5, well, you don't have to read along, but you can just listen as I read this. One day Jesus was teaching in a house, and the healing power of the Lord was with him. Pharisees and religious scholars were sitting and listening, having, some, uh, having come from villages all across the regions of Galilee, Judea, and from the holy city of Jerusalem. Some men came to the house carrying a paralyzed man on his bed pallet. They wanted to bring him in and present him to Jesus, but the house was so packed with people that they couldn't get in. So they climbed up on the roof and pulled off some roof tiles. Then they lowered the man by rope, so he came to rest right in front of Jesus. In this way, their faith was visible to Jesus. Jesus says, my friend, all your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and religious scholars were offended at this. They turned to one another and asked questions. Who does he think he is? Wasn't that blasphemous? Who can pronounce that a person's sins are forgiven? Who but God alone? Jesus replies, why are your hearts full of questions? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? Just so you'll know that the Son of Man is fully authorized to forgive sins on earth, he turns to the paralyzed fellow lying on the pallet, I say, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then, right in front of their eyes, the man stood up, picked up his bed, and left to go home, full of praises for God. Jesus, we just thank you today for all that you want to unpack, God, that you don't... uh, Today, we don't want just information, and we don't want just inspiration. We want transformation. God, would you do a good work in us, not just to help us feel better or inspire, but really to take this, to do something new in us, and allow us to take it out to every area of our world where we can. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and grab a seat. I've been coming to this church since I was 18, and when I started coming... That was a little bit of a mess. I had a lot going on up here and in here. And uh, I had a good friend named Dennis who, well, he became a good friend. But this guy, he reaches out to me. And he's like, hey, let's, let's get together. I'd like to, to hang out with you. And so one time turned into two times, turned into a weekly get-together with this guy. And he already had a lot going on in his world. He was engaged. He was just about to get married. So very full season, especially if you've been there, you know, that's a full season. And yet this guy just kept making time to get together with me, invite him, invite me into his world uh, with his fiance, with the people he hung out with, you know. And so we'd have weekly meetings. We'd have Sunday after church hanging out at his house, doing spaghetti and, and playing video games or whatever, and just spending time together. And in that season, I feel like I really unpacked some things in my life and helped me just shift things. And he would always, uh, Dennis would keep calling me on stuff, right? I'd say something because I had a lot of self-esteem issues and he'd just be like, shut up. He would tell me all the time. He said a lot, shut up. And uh, he'd be like, shut up. Don't say that about yourself. That's not what God says about you. This is what God says about you. And then he would flip open the Bible and he would show me, this is who God says you are. And he just kept showing this to me, and and it really just changed the way I viewed myself, viewed God, and I really am confident that I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't have a season in that time of community that was just so essential to me in that time. Community brings real change and allows real change to happen, and there's power in that. So, last week, 
Monica kicked off this series, Squad Goals, and we're talking about the power of community, what that looks like. We're setting this up not just as, again, not inspiration or even information, uh, but really something more. We want to motivate. We want to see transformation happen in us and bring people into all that God wants to do. So there's, when it comes to that, see, we can sit here on a Sunday, and we, it's nice to be in rows, but there's something more powerful when you get in circles, when you get into circles and groups and you get to really connect in this way, that's so significant. And that could look like anything. That could look like uh, playing volleyball at the rec center or having a connect group in your home or going out with some people that you're inviting after church today for, for lunch or whatever that could look like for you. Jumping on a team and serving together. There's so many ways that we can do that. And this is how, this is how the early church functioned. Uh, right from the start, they met together daily. They ate together. They shared together. They prayed together. They did life together. Everybody just say together. Yeah. And if this seems weird to you, like, oh, it's a little much, it actually was kind of strange back then in many ways too because, you know, a lot of the way we find, or we find ourselves thinking about church, maybe you think or have thought this way, is similar to what people would have thought back then when they said, oh, church, that's a semi-regular religious gathering to fulfill a spiritual sense of duty. That's why I go to church. Oh, yeah, you know, once in a while, I will go to that religious gathering to fulfill a sense of spiritual duty. I did what I needed to do. And this has been a cultural thing for so long, just this perspective. And yet Jesus came and said, I'm going to shatter that. I'm going to transform what you think it should be, and we're going to bring people into community, and you're going to see real life change happen together in a brand new way. And that's what we want to talk about today. And so that historical account I just read, Luke 5, this incredible story, is so significant and so powerful, and it paints a picture of what true community like really looks like and uh, what it does in us and what it costs to get that. So Jesus arrives in town. And by now, everybody's heard of this Jesus. They, whether they believe he is who he says he is or they're not sure, they just, everybody wants to show up and see who this Jesus is. And so we see how four friends right away are like, oh man, Jesus is here. We got to go. Let's go grab our stuff. Let's go. And one of them's like, wait, 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 wait. Now these four friends all stop. You know what? I'm going to call them uh, I'm going to call them Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, okay? So Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, they're all, they all stop, and one of them is like, wait, 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 we got to bring our friend Perry. Now I'm going to call him Perry, because he's paralyzed. I don't know if that's in poor taste, but it's going to help you remember, okay? So they're, they're like, Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, like, we got to bring Perry with us, because what if, what if Jesus is who he says he is? Like, what if he actually can encourage him? What if he can heal our friend Perry, we gotta bring him with us. I mean, imagine what life would be like for Perry in this time. You're trapped, essentially, on a little mat pallet thing that you have to be carried around on. You are totally stuck here. People have to feed you and help you. You can't really get a job. You can't really seem to contribute much to society. You know, it seems overwhelming. I mean, what does this guy have going for him? Well, I'll tell you. He has some amazing friends. He has some amazing friends. And really, in one sense, this story couldn't happen without his friends. How would Perry have ever gotten to Jesus if friends hadn't come and taken him? And so they are a very vital part of what happens in this. And so, so they decide, okay, wait, 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 what about our friend Perry? We got to bring Perry with us. So they, they, they realize it's like, all right, we're going we're gonna to bring him. Uh, you know, they could do something really good in his life. These friends, they're thinking of him. They're focused on him. They're awesome. Now, I don't know if you have friends like this, but it's good to think about this. If you had a crisis, who would you call at 3 a.m.? Do you have someone that you would call at 3 a.m.? If, if you need prayer for something, who do you ask to pray for you? If, if something amazing happened, who would be the first person you'd call to help celebrate with you? Who do you show your weakness and struggles to? 
who carries your mat for you sometimes? So we've all got a mat. We've all got a mat. And it's a very vulnerable thing to have someone carry your mat and see you in your weakness. And it's incredibly faithful to help someone who can't help themselves and can't pay you back. That's incredible. And that connection between our paralyzed friend Perry and his friends Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, there's this trusting vulnerability and this dependable faithfulness. So we have these guys. I'm going to call them the Fellowship of the Mat. We have the Fellowship of the Mat ready to embark on an incredible journey. And so Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, they tell Perry, hey, Jesus is going to be speaking at, at, at the house at 10 a.m. We're going to pick you up at 9 a.m. Like, we are literally going to pick you up at 9 a.m. And so Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, they carry Perry all the way to Jesus, which would not have been an easy thing through a bustling city and trying to work their way through. And so it's awkward and it's uncomfortable and it's probably exhausting. By the time they get there, it's also cost them because it's packed it's packed. I mean, it is so full in this house that they are oozing, people are oozing out the, the, the doors, the windows, whatever. They're just, they're just crammed in there. And they go, oh, crap. Well, maybe next time. And we've all felt like that. We've all got to moments, relationally even, where it's just like, ugh. Well, we tried. I tried reaching out to this person, but it was exhausting. Or, oh, you know what? I would love to, but pff, I don't have the time for that. I just, I, I, I can't. I can't do that. I mean, come on. We know that in the before moments, before something happens, we have every excuse in the book. We have every reason why we, why we can't, why we shouldn't, whatever. But come on, in, in the after moments, if you've been in moments where you've seen God do something so significant in someone's life, come on, in the after moments, isn't your perspective just like, who cares what it costs me? Like, who cares what it costs me? It's incredible. And it could cost us a lot. But they've made a decision. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. So, Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, they brainstorm. We're not going to give up. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way that we can make this work. And so they're thinking and trying to come up with stuff. Oh, maybe we could uh, just push our way to the front. I don't know if that would work. Uh, maybe we can uh, share a sob story and they'll let us in. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Then Barry, oh, Barry, he has this ridiculous idea, this dangerous, stupid, probably illegal idea. And he's like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Now, come on, we all have a Barry in our life, am I right? We've all got somebody in our life that's like, trust me, guys, this is going to be great, right? And then you find yourself at 4 a.m. on the roof of Wendy's with the cops telling you to come down. You might get charged, hypothetically speaking. We all have berries in our lives. <laughs> and so Barry, he says, hey, I got an idea. Let's go on the roof. Let's destroy some public property or private property. Let's lower Perry's frail body down a full story with whatever rope we can find lying around. And they're all like, okay, I guess we're doing this. Sure. And so for whatever reason, they decide they're going to do this. So they find some ropes. They head upstairs. It wouldn't have been that hard to get up there. I mean, at that time, they would have used the roof uh, a lot of times like a patio. So they probably had stairs or whatever, got up there, and they just start stripping off pieces of the roof. Now, guaranteed that after this story was done, they had to go and pay for damages to the homeowner or fix it themselves. Their decision cost them something. It cost them something. But like I said, in those after moments when you've experienced something significant, who cares? Who cares what it cost, right? It's like, this is going to cost me money to take someone out for coffee. This is going to cost me time to help my friends move or to watch their kids so they can go on a much-needed date. This is going to cost me energy to clean my house and make some food before my connect group shows up. This is going to cost me comfort to help a family member who's working through a sudden problem when all I want to do is watch and binge Stranger Things Season 3. Come on, it's going to cost me something. But you know, if you've had moments like this, whatever it takes... If there's a chance, it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. 
And so Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, they are determined to break through this barrier and do it together because there is a chance that something could change. Psychologist Yuri Bromenbremer, I'm not saying that right, describes true community like this. He says it's a group that possesses and implements an irrational commitment to the well-being of its members. A group that possesses, but also implements, does something with what's in them, and ir- possesses and implements an irrational commitment. Everyone to say irrational commitment. An irrational commitment to the well-being of its members. Let's go crash that roof. Let's go find a way. I mean, what does it take to be a roof crasher? It takes a whatever-it-takes attitude that just says, we're going to find a way. This person is worth it. This person is worth my time, my energy, the inconvenience to my schedule or whatever. This person is worth it. So, what's the rooftop that you need to crash through in your life? What's the rooftop you need to crash through for someone else to have the experience they need to have? I would say for many of us, Insecurity would be one. Who am I to try and help this person? I'm still figuring out myself, right? There could be this insecurity. It's like, nope, smash, I'm breaking through. We're going to get, we're going to find a way to make this happen. I would say maybe though, the most common one for us is busyness. How's your week been? Oh, busy, busy. Oh yeah, what's going on? Oh man, I'm just so busy. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. I can't, I'm busy. I'd love to, but I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Now I get that. We live a busy life life in a busy culture. We also love that word maybe more than we should, but busy. What, what I love is what uh, Christine said at Heart and Soul uh, just over a week ago. We were talking about groups, as you kind of heard already today, and talking about how she, through all the years, her and her husband have just been investing and leading, leading groups, being a part of groups. And she said, she said that she said, yes, life gets busier when we lead or are a part of groups. But it also gets so much fuller. It gets so much fuller. There is a fullness that comes with making God's ultimate priority, people, our priority. There's a fullness that comes in that. And I know that so many of you here, you're in the busiest season of your life. And yet I see so many, I hear so many stories about people that are still leading groups or getting together with people or doing this or that. I'm like, I don't know how you make time for that, but I honor you for that. I honor you for doing that and putting God's ultimate priority first. It takes intentionality to look past our own lives, to see the mats of others and say, I'm going to bring them with me and I'm going to go crash through a roof and make a way. And once you crash through the roof, it opens up to incredible opportunity. In verse 19, it says, They were packed, they climbed up to the roof, then they lowered the man by the ropes, so he came to rest right in front of Jesus. They get him to Jesus. Now, great friends say, Amazing, intentional, irrationally committed friends will say, if I could just get my friend closer to Jesus, if I could just get whoever closer to Jesus, dot, 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 what could happen? I know something could happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but if I could just get them closer to Jesus, not just closer to church, closer to Jesus, Not just a Sunday morning. I could have a coffee and believe that during this time that somehow if there's a way that I could get them closer to understanding God's perspective on who they are, what could happen? That is what an amazing friend does. And so Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, they show irrational commitment. And it was risky for them. I mean, think about it. If you're them, they're like, okay, Perry's trusting us, but what if we drop him? I'm going to try my best at whatever I'm going to do, but what if I end up hurting the person unintentionally? What if I drop this person? Or what if Jesus is like super pissed that I interrupted his message? I mean, he's a really good communicator and he's on a roll. I can tell he's not going to like this. Or what if people start snapping pictures and posting on social media and make me look like a fool for what I'm doing out of context? All these thoughts going through their heads. 
This is a great example of a rational commitment to the well-being of others. And when you take a step of faith, listen to me on this, when you take a step of faith, God notices. He notices and it catches his attention. It goes on in that verse after they've lowered him down, it says in verse 20, in this way, so they lower him down, they lower him by ropes, rest right in front of Jesus. In this way, their faith was visible to Jesus. Their faith, these guys that lower down this man, their faith was visible to Jesus. And so Jesus looks at these four friends and he looks at you and he sees all the ways that you're reaching out to people, that you're inconveniencing yourself to make time, to make time. You have time. We can make it. It's possible to make time to connect with people. He sees every step of faith that you take and he says, mm, that is humanity at its finest. That is good stuff right there. That is what I want. And after seeing the faith of Harry, Gary, Larry, and Barry, Jesus, he turns to Perry. And this is what he says. It says, you are healed. Rise up and walk. Actually, it's not what it says. <laughs> what it really said, what he actually said was this. My friend, all your sins are forgiven. Wait, what? Let's go back to the other one. That's, that's what we want. We brought him all this way because we want him to get healed. What, Jesus, what are you talking about? Sins are forgiven. Can you not tell the real reason? I know we haven't explained it, but isn't it obvious what he needs? What are you doing, Jesus? I mean, come on. They're probably thinking, it's like, really? Like, what sins can a paralytic even do? Jesus knows that the most deadliest sins, resentment, judging, jealousy, anger, bitterness, these are the ones that we can commit without having to lift a finger. And so he gets right to it. He looks past a broken body and he looks to a broken heart. And he recognizes the real need that all of us actually need. Forgiveness. A heart that is healed and whole. And anything else is just nice byproduct. That is an incredible miracle. And so from their place... On the rooftop, four friends watch as Jesus speaks life into this man and frees him from the bondage of sin and then also restores power to a paralyzed body. And he does the impossible. And it's incredible. And then he tells him, I say, get up, take your mat, and go home. Get up, take your mat, and go home. And then right in front of their eyes, the man stood up, picked up his mat, picked up his bed, and left to go home full of praises to God. Now, I don't know, it doesn't say after that how the story plays out after that, but I have a pretty good theory that he's saying praises to God. So he is celebrating. He's like, oh my gosh, this changed everything. I am on the inside, I am whole. On the outside, I am whole. This is amazing. And so he's running out the door. Everybody's moving out of his way and he's like celebrating in the streets. And of course, we know what's going on upstairs because all four of the guys up on the roof are like, oh, what was that? That was amazing. And so they run off and they're down the stairs and they're running over and there's a group of them and they're all celebrating stand up and they're celebrating and they're like, yeah, this is the best thing ever. And they're, they're going to town and they're having the best time in their life. And they're cheering. And then, at some point, they catch their breath. And they stop for a second. And they, you know, probably, probably make him like, okay, show us. Like, that's amazing. Do a jig. And he's like, look what I can do, right? And then it's, they're, they're like celebrating. And at some point, it calms down enough that he looks at all four of his friends and in a moment of total sincerity, he says, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for caring enough to inconvenience yourself for me. And the amazing thing is, every single one of you, there is someone today, this week, this year, someone is waiting to say thank you to you. They don't even know it yet. 
Because the moment the intersection hasn't happened where you see them in whatever mat they're in and you recognize this is an opportunity for me to bring them to Jesus. And who knows what could happen? And today, this week, this year, there are going to be moments if you would respond to what Jesus wants to do in the lives of people and bring them to where he can do it. I don't mean just physically church. I mean, bring them to that point in the conversation where you can inject Jesus into the solution instead of, oh, just that sucks, oh, too bad. There are answers, and in those moments, he can bring total transformation. Someone is waiting to say, thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for caring about me, even though I've been a pain in the butt to you. You haven't walked away from me. Thank you for what you've done. And it just started with four guys who were excited about something and thought, hey, who could we bring with us? Who can we include in this? It's easier than we think, actually. I think of opportunities I've had that have come out of very simple things. I love movies. I was like, I want to watch movies. I like hanging out with guys. I'm going to invite a couple guys. So I do it. I do it once. I do it again. And then I decide, you know what? I would just like to make this happen regularly so it's not just in the back of my head. I'm going to start a connect group. I'm going to have a movie night. And so I start getting guys to come over and we hang out and we have a great time, but it builds real connection. And there's even been opportunities praying afterwards and stuff. It's just there's an opportunity to just do something you love. And how can you, how can you use that as a platform to just connect people to Jesus and live a full life? What could happen if you just extended your world and brought someone along with you? brought someone into that with you. I mean, come on, do you know how it feels to experience the freedom that only Jesus can give you? I do. Do you know how incredible it is to have people care enough about you that they come along aside you and they get in your business, they get in your life because they care and they, they walk you through things so that you can experience this freedom with Jesus? I do. Do you know what it's like to have a front row seat and watch God do a miracle in someone's life because you've been praying with them or for them or just spending time with them and you create an opportunity at your home, at the coffee shop or whatever for God to do something right there on the front lines? I know what that's like. And it fuels me, not just for them, but what it does in me. Those four guys, we don't know if they got anything out of that. It wasn't like Jesus was like, get up and walk. And you, and you, and you, and you, you get this and this. We don't know that. The only thing we know is that they saw God do something incredible in someone else, and they celebrated it, and they ran with it, and it fueled them. How could it not? That will happen for you when you create the moments. When you think, wait, 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 what about Perry? Wait, 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 what about fill in the blank? What if I did life with this person, this one thing? I'm going to take, I got to go to Edmonton and run air. What if I just invited this person to come with me? Or what if I did this? And you create the moments. What could God do in the moments that could bring real change? I've seen it. We've let, my wife and I have led groups for, for years. And I remember one time in a newer group, a newer couple, after a few weeks, they felt like they could trust us enough to come up and say that they were actually planning to separate. And instead of just going like, oh, that sucks, and just leaving it at like that, I actually cared enough to say, oh, do you want to talk about it? Can we, can we talk about this? Can we get together sometime as a couple or as individuals and, and talk about it? I want to pray for you. I want to believe that maybe there's a way out of this. And let me just tell you, as a side note, that some of the most incredible God moments I have ever witnessed, just like light bulb moments and real life change moments, some of the most significant ones have happened on my living room couch. Sitting there with someone else in my home, on my time, making room, and I watched something incredible happen. And I saw, for example, that couple, I saw them work through somewhere. It seemed like there was no way out, and God brought restoration, and he did a miracle, and I got a front row seat to what Jesus did because I was there to help facilitate it. Let's go. Let's not just stay where you are. Oh, you're on a mat. You're stuck in this. You feel paralyzed. There's no way out of this situation. I'm going to get you to where you need to go because I know Jesus can change any situation. I know he can fix anything in any way he sees fit. And it's incredible. You are invited to be part of those kind of miracles. Every day, 
Every moment, God wants to use you and bring you into this fellowship of the mat through every relationship, or every marriage, every friendship, every co-work connection that you have, every connect group you're a part of, or team you're a part of, whatever it is. He wants to use that to do something bigger, to, draw, to carry people to where Jesus is. Now, I would like to say as a side note too, maybe you feel like you're in a season where there ain't nobody to carry you. You look around at your friend group and you're like, nobody's carrying me. Nobody seems to care. You're sitting here in this church and you're like, I don't think anybody knows my name. They don't care. I would encourage you to not choose the road that says, I'm gonna criticize the lack of carriers around me. And instead to say, okay, if I don't have anyone to carry me right now, I'm just gonna be the carrier. I'm going to find someone who needs to be carried. I'm going to sow what I want to reap. I'm going to become the friend I wish I had right now. And Jesus sees your faith and he responds and you watch what happens. So don't, don't limit yourself. Don't keep yourself stuck on a mat saying there ain't nobody who cares about me. Just stand up, be the carrier and watch what God would do in your life. Can we stand up right now as we wrap up today? Jesus does a good work in our lives all the time and think man so many of you know oh this opportunity and this and especially the longer you get to experience a life with christ you will see so much if you choose to respond and respond and respond to the moments you can have such a full incredible life of oh i wouldn't change anything it has been busy but it's been full and i want to give us that opportunity today to respond to that It's not always easy to be a part of carrying someone's mat or being carried. It can be awkward. It can be heavy. It can be difficult. And there are a lot of roofs that we might have to break through, like fear and and doubt and worry and all these different things, but they can be broken through. And so maybe, maybe you're here today. Many of us are. We were like the man on the mat. You were Perry at some point in your life, and you felt trapped, and you felt like nothing could happen, but somebody, somewhere, brought you along, picked you up, connected you in because they were saying, I just wonder if maybe if I can get your name closer to Jesus, what could happen? And you did experience exactly that. Or maybe you're here and you are Perry and you feel trapped. You feel paralyzed in a world of just fear, anxiety, doubt, wonder, confusion, anger, uh, situations that seem to overwhelm you, whatever it is, you feel locked into that. And yet, would you consider the fact that maybe the reason you're here today is not chance, but somebody has been saying that about you. If I could just get your name closer, what could Jesus do? Today is your moment where Jesus can do exactly what he wants to do and he aligns us up and i want to invite us now to just close our eyes and i want to give an opportunity for us to respond because what good is this if we don't respond we need to respond to what jesus wants to bring freedom in our lives and and so i want to invite you to pray with all of us here as we pray together and just say jesus thank you that you see me in my brokenness where i'm trapped thank you for the people that you put in my life to orchestrate this moment and bring me closer to you. Today, I take a big step of faith and I put my faith in you, that you are who you say you are and that you can do what you say you do. So Jesus, thank you that as you bought my freedom, I step into it now. I receive your life and a new beginning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good. I want to pray one more prayer. And it's for all you carriers. And if you just prayed that and you just got off the mat, you can instantly be a carrier. As if that guy wasn't. You can't tell me that Perry didn't run off and be like, who else needs to get over here? I know my buddy that that also needs help. I'm going to get him here. I want to pray for the carriers. Because God wants us to just step up like never before. And so Jesus, I thank you for every single one of us here that we would be, uh, those of us in the room, those of us watching online, that we would step up 
and recognize as inconvenient as it might be or just whatever goes through our head in the before moments. Lord, we look ahead to the after moments and we see the people that you put on our heart and say, we want, man, what if? What if? Wouldn't that be worth it? Yes. And so Jesus, we just, we just choose to respond and say, we will do what we can to draw p- people close to you, to make it easier for them to connect with you. Jesus, we will do our part. We will carry them. We will break through the roofs. We will make a way to get real connection happening so you can do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you guys grab a seat? We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.